good returns to the one who gives. The Pali Canon and its related literature are full of expositions on dana and its benefits, and numerous discourses on the topic have been given on a regular basis, ever since the time of the Buddha up to the present day, in monasteries and retreat centers around the world. Great, of course, is also the number of essays and books elaborating it. This discourse does not add much, if anything, to the overall debate on the concept of dana, especially on a scholarly level, but is intended to serve the purpose of a somewhat detailed overview that may straightforwardly enrich knowledge to be applied practically. In that, this discourse will draw exclusively from source materials that have been transmitted in the Pali tradition, including commentary explanations, of which we can be confident that they contain early Buddhist material. It is customary since the time of the historical Buddha that bhikkhus oftentimes take on teaching roles towards the Buddhist laity, if not being engaged in higher morality, meditation and wisdom, inside increased seclusion whereas the latter is creating the material backdrop for the former by donations of various kinds, as can be understood from this excerpt from the Bahukara Sutta, contained in the Itivuttaka, a collection of Buddhist saying comprised of prose and verse portions. This interdependence serves the purpose of ending suffering. To quote, Pekkus, Brahmins and householders are very helpful to you, they provide you with the requisites of robes, arms food, lodgings, health care and medicines. You, bhikkhus, are also very helpful to Brahmins and householders, as you teach them the Dhamma that is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, correct in meaning and wording, and you explain the holy life, Brahmacharya, in its complete fulfillment and purity. Thus, monks, this spiritual life is lived depend on each other, for the purpose of crossing the flood and putting a proper end to suffering. Putting a proper end to suffering here refers to the ultimate goal of Buddhism, namely Nibbana, which was also called by the Buddha the highest pleasure or happiness, Paramang Sukhang in Pali. How dana specifically relates to this and aspects of more mundane forms of reducing suffering and increasing pleasure I am going to flesh out, then, by means of what follows. After a brief definition, I will talk about the overall characteristics, manifestations, functions, causes and benefits of dana. The word dana derives from the Pali root da, to give, from which are also formed uh, such verbs as tadati, gifts, donates, and diati, offers. Succinctly defined, dana is the intention consisting of compassion and veneration that occurs before, during, and after relinquishing oneself or a suitable item. It also stands for the object to be given itself. The intention that occurs prior to the actual giving, pupa chetana, includes for the sake of making a donation, obtaining the object to be given away, the pondering about offering the item, after one has procured it, and the looking out for a suitable recipient. The intention that occurs after donation has been made can be understood as a pure re-examination of one's previous giving, with an elated mind that is not attached, thinking, how good that I have properly made a formless gift. The intention that actually relinquishes the gift, Muncha Chaitana, is the one happening during the event more or less obviously. In this connection, it has also been said, that by which one gives is dana, diyati anenati dana, that is, the intention that prompts the action of giving. In the Sankhita Dana Sutta contained in the Anguttara Nikaya, giving up, chago, which overlaps with the concept of dana, has been called a spiritual wealth alongside faith, morality, moral shame, moral dread, learning and wisdom. A person being accomplished in giving up is defined as someone, to quote the Buddha, who, with a mind rid of the stain of miserliness, dwells at home, giving freely, open-handed, delighting in relinquishing, devoted to charity, delighting in gifts, dana and donations. 
In the Sangyutta Nikaya Sadhu Sutta, dana, supposedly in the struggle to give up pleasant objects, has even been linked to battle. We must brace ourselves in order to be victorious. Dana is characterized by abandonment. Its function is to destroy attachments to dear objects and to conquer miserliness. It has the property of faultlessness. It manifests as the absence of attachment or the achievement of a good rebirth in the human or the heavenly world, as well as great wealth. The proximate, but not the only, cause is actually the possession of a gift, without which no generosity as discussed can take place. Similarly, without faith or conviction, sadda, one doesn't exert oneself to give dana. The reasons to give dana may vary, as we come to see later in some more detail. One may give wanting to return a favor, in the hope of personal gain in the here or in the afterlife or thinking that giving is generally a good thing. Reflecting on the family custom or spiritual tradition of giving may prompt the nations as well, as to considerations of simply attaining a happy mind while giving or regarding it as a mere ornamentation in support of the mind. The most superior motivating force for giving dana is the aspiration to attain Nibbana. Some reflections that help to cause acts of giving are Possessions of attachment bring tremendous harm to those attached. They are subject to confiscation and taken away by thieves, set off disputes while creating foes and are basically unsubstantial. To acquire and guard them, one needs to harass others and their destruction follows various kinds of disasters, such as mourning and lamentation, even the taking up of arms. The attachment involved causes the mind's obsession with stinginess, with the result that one is eventually reborn into the subhuman realms of existence. On the other hand, one instance of relinquishing these objects of attachment is a step to safety, for which reason one should renounce them with great diligence. Dana is the first among the ten perfections issuing in Buddhahood, Dasaparamyu, because it is common to all beings, even ordinary people, and because, comparatively, it is the least fruitful in terms of karmic outcome and is the easiest to practice, again relatively speaking, as everyone who is seriously engaged in practicing of giving, let alone perfecting it, has probably noticed that it is not at all easy to part with the dear object. Dana is also part of the three bases of meritorious actions, Tini Punya Kriyawatuni, alongside with morality, Silang, and meditation, Bhavana. Of the extended ten bases of meritorious action, Dasa Punya Kriyawatuni, of which Dana is also part, the sharing of one's own merits, Patti Dana, and rejoicing in the merits of others, Patanu Modana, for example, by acknowledging acts of merit with the word sadhu, meaning it is well, can be subsumed under the rubric of dana, since these counteract jealousy and envy as well. There are three main types of dana physical gifts, amisadana, the gift of dhamma, dhamma dana, the teachings of the Buddha, and the gift of fearlessness, abhayadana. The triad of giving, morality and wisdom perfects all three types. The giving that is done in the hope of gaining worldly pleasures is called an enslaving gift, dasadana, whereas a gift done in hope of nibbana is called a liberating gift, bhujjasadana. Instead of setting up such praiseworthy and noble intentions, when one, distracted by craving and wrong views, aspires for a result of an act of dana to become a heavenly being, it cannot serve as a sufficing condition for the attainment of Nibbana, and is thus also classed a more grasping gift, paramatta dana, or a gift based on the round of rebirths, watta dana, still productive of and situated plainly in the future suffering, subject to craving. The latter type of dana, which is not so blemished, but is made with the express purpose of attaining Nibbana, 
is additionally classed as a non-grasping gift, a paramatta dana, or a gift based upon cessation of the round of rebirths, vivattanisitta dana. Once we are fortunate enough to encounter the teachings of the Buddhas, understanding how domineering this craving is, its truly insatiable nature, how direly we must suffer in fulfilling its whims, one makes offerings with aspiration for the attainment of Nibbana, the uprooting of this craving, resolving, I will no longer be a servant of this terrible craving, I will no longer fulfill its wishes, I will rebel against it, I will go against it. A gift acquired righteously, based upon morality, is called a righteous gift, dhammiyadana, or a blameless gift, anawajjadana, as opposed to an unrighteous one, called adhammiyadana, or a blameworthy one, called sawajjadana. Although the latter forms are still said to be meritorious, they may still bring only good results in subhuman realms due to the immoral activities involved in procuring the gifts. We may consider cases where horses are given nutritious food and are groomed, but overall, they are just still horses, right? So I hope uh, this will provide some basis for deciding which types of dana are best to cultivate. However, leaving this aside for the time being, let us consider the main types of dana in detail beginning with physical gifts. The actual items to be given away as dana make up a list of 10 in the sutta classification. Foodstuff, non-alcoholic drinks, transportation, including such things as slippers, flowers, perfume powder, unguents, ointments, seeds or bags and dwelling places. Since these were mentioned merely as the most common types of offerings at the Buddhist time, we must note that other proper kinds of gifts are of course allowable as well, also considering that any proper material gift may also be classified under one of the above items or headings. In the Vinaya classification, we find a set of four classes of items that can be given to the Buddhist monastic community. Clothing, chivarang, foodstuffs, pindapato, lodgings, senasana, as well as healthcare, gilana, patcheo, and medicines, behesadjang. In addition to these standard items, we also find mention of general material gifts of gems, gold and silver, including money, pearls, coral, fields, land, parks, roads, bridges, manpower, cows, buffaloes, and uh, many more of these kind of things. Things Buddhist monks are, however, not allowed to accept, including money in whatever form. It is also common to find descriptions of donors who give away whole villages, cities, provinces, and even kingdoms. Gifts that accrue to a specific heir after one's death, in accordance to one's will, is also classified as a dana. It is interesting to note that the Kutadanta Sutta, Diga Nikaya, Discourse No. 5, contains also a hierarchy of gifts, where the gift of lodging ranks the highest, even surpassing those gifts of, for example, food made on a daily basis for a hundred years, other things being equal. Similar considerations apply for building enduring structures such as parks, wells, bridges. This gift of lodgings or a home, upasayu, is also said by the Buddha in the Sanyutta Nikaya to bestow all things at once that some other gifts of material dana may bestow, such as strength in the case of food, beauty in the case of clothing, ease in the case of vehicles, and vision in the case of lighting. According to the Abhidhamma classification, dana can also be linked to the six sense objects, that is, form or color, rupang, sound, saddo, smells, Kando, taste, raso, tangibility, potapvang, and mind objects, tamaramana. A rupa dana is uh, given, for example, when one has attained some object, minerals, cloth, etc., that is of a particular color, perhaps blue. 
The donor considers then only the color if possible. I shall make an offering of color. This is my gift of color, he thinks. The same method applies with considerations with the appropriate changes. In the context of Gandhadana, a typical Dana would be flowers, Rasadana, where a characteristic gift is that of food, and Potapadana, giving, for example, such things as bedspreads and chairs. A Sandadana, a gift of sound, can be achieved by giving, for instance, medicines that may aid the vocal performance of those who lecture on Dhamma, or announcing it, reciting the texts, giving a discourse oneself, having a discussion, or expressing appreciation for the good deeds of others. The gift of a mind object in this context is designated the Dhammadana, not meaning a gift of the Buddha's teachings here, but one of nutriment, drink and life. Getting doctors to wait upon the sick, liberating birds from a net, releasing prisoners, forbidding animal slaughter, or undertaking any such similar actions for the sake of protecting life falls under this point as well. All these kind of material offerings are collectively called Vattudana or Amisadana. It matters a great deal for the resultant karma if the offerings are prepared with care and attention to detail or not. The former type is called a careful or respectful gift, Sakkachadana, and the latter an uncareful or disrespectful gift, a Sakkachadana. Just dumping a bunch of flowers on the monastery shrine or at the stupa brings less distinct results than carefully arranging them in a beautiful pattern placing them gently and reverentially on the offering table. A superior offering also includes giving righteously obtained gifts, giving whatever is needed, giving sufficiently, distributing gifts equally, giving constantly on a regular basis, vibhattadana, giving supplementary items that are accompaniments of the main thing to be given, sapariwaradana not giving unsuitable items, not giving discarded or leftover items, anucchetta not giving things that cause affliction, such as weapons or drugs, not providing amusements that lead to negligence. Internal gifts are those of entering into voluntary servitude for the welfare of beings and giving away even one's own limbs and organs for those who would benefit from them in a wholesome way. Not easy for sure. There is, of course, also the gift of the Buddhist Dhamma, his teachings in the forms of discourses, books and the like. We may be permitted to also include social media posts here. It is important that these materials outline how to attain the good in the present life, the life to come and the ultimate bliss of Nibbana. This kind of gift has been declared by far the most valuable gift of all, since for some reason, uh, for one reason, excuse me, it is by teaching about dana that such actually happens in the first place. Without beings ever hearing about the benefits of giving, they may, at times at least, not even give so much as a spoon of rice. Besides that, and more importantly, only by means of hearing the Buddhist Dhamma May beings realize the path, maggo, and fruition, palang, of stream entry, zota, patti, and the other attainments, the only things of essential value. In that sense, not even erecting, without exaggeration, even hundreds of thousands of monasteries can equal the gifts of Dhamma in meritorious outcome, punyang. As the Buddha explained in the Sangyutta Nikaya, the one who instructs in accordance with the Dhamma is one who gives the deathless, that is, ultimate Nibbana. Amatangda do cha sohoti yo Dhamma nusasati. And in the Dhammapada, verse 354, it says, The gift of Dhamma surpasses all other gifts. Sapadanang Dhammadanang jinati. Finally, we should mention a form of gift called the gift of fearlessness. Abhayadana. This type of dana can be made by the observation of the five precepts, Panchasilani, 
the most basic form of Buddhist, in fact universal morality, that is abstention from killing living beings, theft, sexual misconduct, lying, and the intake of intoxicants. While we abstain from these hurtful forms of conduct, beings around us can relax and be at ease, being rid of the fear in our presence. It also stands for the giving of protection to beings when they experience fear due to governments, thieves, fire, water, enemies, uh, wild beasts such as lions, tigers, etc. Combined with morality, silang, giving perfect doing what is beneficial for others and refraining from what harms them. In the case of bodhisattvas, who practice over countless eons for the attainment of full Buddhahood, giving is always associated by compassion, karuna, and skillfulness in means, upaya kosala, which turns ordinary acts of giving into the perfections issuing in Buddhahood, parami. And according to one list found in the Sangyutta Nikaya, the qualities possessed by a noble disciple, Aryasavako, are as follows. The noble disciple dwells at home with the mind rid of the stain of miserliness, giving freely, open-handed, delighting in relinquishing, devoted to charity, delighting in gifts and donations. Generally speaking, the act of dana may be associated with knowledge about the laws of karma and may also be giving dissociated from such, for example, due to blindly following what other people do. Giving may also be prompted or not. I'll come to speak a bit more about this aspect shortly. Either accompanied by joy or equanimity. According to the teachings of the Abhidhamma, beautiful mental factors such as mindfulness, sati, non-greed, alopo, non-hatred, adoso, and tranquility, rectitude, and lightness of consciousness are present during acts of giving dana. We must also consider the fact that the Supreme Buddha taught the purification of dana by means of the giver itself, meaning that his or her moral status or refinement can purify, that is, enhance the potency of the gift presented even to an immoral person. The giver, Dayako, is said to enhance the potency by way of having a happy mind, Summa no Hoti, before giving having faith or conviction during the offering, and being glad just after the act has been accomplished, without experiencing any remorse, corresponding to what was explained also earlier uh, while offering a succinct definition of dana about the intentions prior to giving, puppa, chetana, etc. The giver further enhances the potency of the gift by his overall moral conduct, his faith in the law of karma, and the righteous acquisition of the items to be given. All these factors play into ensuring the maximum benefits of dana. Superior attitudes and placing offerings also include giving with one's own hands, giving unasked, promising to give something excellent, one follows through, actually, giving items that are especially dear to oneself, giving with the thought that the items to be given not just uh, belong to oneself, but to others as well. Giving while not uh, detesting those who ask one, but rather seeing them as intimate friends, especially those who ask for a gift since they are said to confide a secret in their, in their request, like a, like a heartfelt thing that is dear to, uh, that is dear to them. Giving not expecting homage from the doni, giving without deceiving others, giving gifts accompanied by kind words and a smile on one's face, giving with care a serene mind full of compassion, giving while contemplating the nature of the items being given away, that they are subject to loss and dissipation, giving accompanied with the belief in karma and its fruits, giving not expecting something material in return, but merely for the sake of supporting enlightenment. It also matters if dana is given hesitantly 
or only after having been urged or entreated by others, such as would be the case with children when their parents want to instill good manners in them, given instructions to bow down to bhikkhus and receive their bows to offer arms when they have approached the house. The former type is called a prompted gift, asankarika dana. The latter, an unprompted gift, asankarika dana. Here, urging does not include simple requests that are complied with willingly and without hesitation. A prompted gift also incorporates self-persuasion and instigation. We may, therefore, be well advised to follow the Buddha's instruction as transmitted in Dhammapada verse 160. Be quick in doing good. Hold back the mind from evil. Surely, for the one who is doing marriage slowly, the mind delights in evil. In the Avuttika Sutta, contained in the Ittivuttaka, the Buddha spoke about three types of donors. One who is like a rainless cloud, like a cloud that rains locally, and one like a cloud that rains everywhere. The first type doesn't give anything. The, the second selectively to some, but not to others. And the third gives to all. Pouring down offerings, we may be permitted to conclude indiscriminately onto sentient beings. If we notice that our minds do not rejoice and leap up at the thought of giving, we may, for one, conclude that we have not been accustomed to this practice in past times. Therefore, we should make an effort in the here and now so that our minds will find delight in this kind of practice in the future. Such hesitancy may also be the result of unfavorable outer or inner conditions, for example, a shoddy dwelling place or sickness. The Vachagotta Sutta, which is part of the Anguttara Nikaya, importantly notes that someone who prevents another from giving dana would create three obstructions or harms. He or she obstructs the merit of the giver, the gain of the recipient, and his own self or character is undermined. I would say that now is a good point to talk about the kinds of recipients that influence the outcome of dana. The Dakkinavi Bhanga Sutta, Majjhima Nikai, Discourse number 142, lists 14 kinds of individuals to whom dana can be given. I list them with the potency a gift takes on as given by the Buddha. The fruit of dana is said to be incalculable, asankeya, immeasurable, appameya. When given to a Tathagata, meaning a Buddha, individual Buddha, Pacheka Buddha, holy disciple, Arahat, non-returner, Anagami, once returner, Sakadagami, stream enterer, Sotapanno, or those who have attained the respective path, Maggan, towards each of these attainments. A gift given to a non-Buddhist recluse who is accomplished in meditative absorption, jhana, or supernormal powers, abhinya, is said to yield a fruit that is a hundred thousand times a hundred thousand fold. Whereas an ordinary layperson who possesses morality may influence the gift in a way as to proliferate it a hundred thousand fold, which is a lot. An ordinary layperson who is devoid of morality still brings out a yield that is a thousandfold. Last and surely least comes the animal, which still engenders a nice hundredfold return, as the Buddha fittingly taught in the Anguttara Nikaya. I tell you, Vajja, even if a person throws the rinsings of a bowl or a cup into a village pool or pond, thinking, may whatever animals live here feed on this, that would be a source of merit to say nothing of what is given to human beings. But I do say that what is given to a virtuous person is of great fruit, and not so much what is given to an unvirtuous person. It is of high importance to note that the gift of the noble community of monastics, Sangho, even to an unvirtuous representative, surpasses any dana to a single individual, according to the same Dakkina Vibhanga Sutta of the Majjhima Nikaya. For that reason, it greatly enhances the potency when giving dana to individual monastics to consider them as uh, representatives of the Sangha as a whole. 
a gift called Sangika Dana, by the way. The view that Dana should only be given to morally pure monastics is, accordingly, untenable, as can be gathered from the following quote from the mentioned discourse. In future times, Ananda, there will be members of the clan, that is, members of the Sangha, merely by name, who are yellow necks, immoral, of evil character. People will give gifts to those immoral persons for the sake of the Sangha. Even then, I say, an offering made to the Sangha is incalculable, immeasurable, and I say that in no way is a gift to a person individually ever more fruitful than an offering made to the Sangha. End quote. However, the Buddha taught, in particular, for example, in the Uposatta Sutta of the Anguttara Nikaya, that the eight kinds of noble individuals, Atta, Purisa, Pukkala, that is, the stream enterer, once returner, non returner, the Arahant, and those on the respective path of these fruitions, are worthy of offerings, Takkineyo. The recipient, as could be understood from what we have just elaborated in earlier portions, also holds a great power over the outcome of a gift by means of being free from such mental mental hindrances excuse me as lust lopo aversion dozo or delusion moho and having attained a saintly stage or practicing for the attainment of such thus the best result in terms of karma is understandably when both giver and recipient are equipped with morally virtuous qualities. If both are endowed with such qualities, their yield is said to be not easy to measure. In the same way that it is not easy to quantify the water in the great ocean as per the number of buckets contained in it. Therefore, a giver should blamelessly consider. One should give if someone comes for a donation. And also that bodhisattvas, in fulfillment of the dana parami, make their offerings without discriminating between persons of high, medium or low status of development, which is said to be the defilement of the perfection of dana. Giving, it is said, is the path taken by all bodhisattvas, the road frequented by all buddhas. This does not imply that one approves of the potentially bad habits of the doni. The story of a rich donor of a monastery can perhaps be related on this occasion. A rich householder, who had already donated the monastery, intended to make an offering to the Sangha. After making necessary preparations, he went to the order of bhikkhus and uh, addressed them. Venerable sirs, may you designate someone to receive my offering for the Sangha? It happened uh, that it was the turn of an immoral bhikkhu to represent the Sangha for arms. Although the man knew well that the designated bhikkhu was immoral, he treated him with full respect. The seat for the bhikkhu was prepared as for a ceremonious occasion, decorated with a canopy over hat, and scented with flowers and perfumes. He washed the feet of the bhikkhu and anointed them with oil very reverentially, as if he were attending upon the person of the Buddha himself. He then made his offering to the bhikkhu, paying full homage to the Sangha. Although virtuous individuals and the Buddhist Sangha as a whole are particularly excellent fields of merit, where even a small gift bears great karmic fruit, with due consideration, dana should nevertheless also be given to family, extended relatives, friends, colleagues, guests, travelers, including those visiting and departing, as well as the sick. And in times of crisis, those in need should be liberally catered to. Particularly requiring public generosity are destitutes, kapana, travelers, attika, mendicants, yanipaka, and beggars, yataka. Gifts placed at stupas, shrines, and similar structures of worship are commonly very fruitful and potent as well. We must, however, also consider that the Buddha declared that one should give dana at an occasion when one's mind is pleased, chittang pasidati. But the conditions for making the result of dana great may be a different matter. Of course, we have some influence to make our minds pleased, for example, with the following considerations about those who ask for a gift and thoughts about giving in general, to name. Someone who asked is said to be a teacher 
who conveys the truth that upon departing from this world we must abandon everything. He is said to be like a companion in that he helps us to move stuff from this world to the next so that they benefit us over there through our giving to him. He assists us in removing worries connected to the objects. One who asks for a gift is our best friend in that he helps us to gain the noble attainments and even supreme buddhahood. We should be sincerely grateful that someone asks us on his own accord without us having to search ourselves for a recipient. Giving is beneficial for oneself as well as the other person. One may also ask oneself, when will beggars feel free to take my belongings on their own accord and how can they be dear and agreeable to me? All these are some of the stratagems to arouse inclinations towards giving. Another notable feature of dana is the fact that Buddhas do not accept food that has been acquired directly through sharing verses of Dhamma. Furthermore, Buddhist monastics are not allowed to engage in work for payment or accept any monetary donations whatsoever, but must solely rely on gifts of allowable requisites provided by others. The procedure is actually uh, fairly straightforward. One can either invite the monastic directly by statements uh, such as Bhante, if you need anything allowable, please feel free to contact me for that matter. Or one may inform them about an indirect donation that was given to a steward. Bhante, I have placed the monetary donations of such and such an amount with a person named so and so. If you need anything allowable, please feel free to contact them. The money placed with the steward still belongs to the donor until some items for the respective amounts have been procured. Since if the steward, for some reason, doesn't attend to the bhikkhu's needs when approached, the monastics should inform the orig original donor about the matter, suggesting he or she should claim what is theirs because it produced no benefit. As such invitations have, technically, no expiration date. The relevant Pachitya rule number 47 doesn't cover these kinds of invitations, but only common sense discretion applies for the monastics. It is, however, possible for the donor to put in place any restrictions, uh, restrictions excuse me, as to applicable time period, type of item or amount. He could, for example, invite in this manner. Pande, if you need honey within the next three months you are staying here, please let me know and I will see to it. The monastics would be bound by it and fall into an offense if they ask for things uninvited, unless they are sick, approach co-monastics or blood relatives. Having elaborated now on some details about the classes of dana, the various items to be given, the qualities of donors and those of the recipients, let me say a few words about the actual benefits that the practice of giving can bring us. Good returns to the one who gives without concern, just as the boomerang returns to the one who threw it without concern. Perhaps a few general things should be said at this juncture about the benefits of uh, the practice of dana. Dana results in myriads of beneficial, wholesome, pleasant results, prompting the Buddha even to teach the following remarkably potent dana sutta, which can be found in the Ittivuttaka, to quote, if beings knew, as I know, the results of giving and sharing, they would not eat without having given, nor would the stain of selfishness overcome their minds. Even if it were their last bite, their last mouthful, they would not eat without having shared, if there were someone to receive their gift. But because beings do not know, as I know, the results of giving and sharing, they eat without having giving. The stain of selfishness overcomes their mind. End quote. Giving is the protection of men and women, of course, the nourishment of pleasure, heavenly, ripening in pleasure, leading to heaven, sakka sangwattaniko, leading to what is agreeable, pleasing, charming, happy and beneficial. It forestalls jealousy and envy as the Dhammapada 
verse 220, 223, excuse me, enjoins us. Conquer stinginess by means of a gift. Jinne kadari yang dani na. Dana is the support of friends, the best way out for sentient beings fallen into suffering, a treasure, a boat in the sense that it ferries across suffering, a city because it protects from dangers, a poisonous snake in the sense that it is hard to attack, a lotus unsmeared by the dirt of greed and the other defilements. In the world, a man has no refuge like giving. Therefore, proceed with the intent to do it. Gifts are the causes of a rebirth in the heavenly world. For in this world, what is it that wise men devoted to good would not give? What man, having heard that prosperity among the gods originates from giving, would not give a gift, a core tied to happiness for the donor, a joy to the mind? If one has turned to giving, surrounded by nymphs, one rejoices in the heaven of Nandana that is delighting, where the gods find their pleasure for a very long time. A giver finds sublime joy, is respected in this world. A giver goes to an endless renown, and a giver is trustworthy. Having given a gift, a man attains prosperity, wealth, a long life, and his body finds harmony. In heaven, he sports together with goddesses. To quote the Dhammapada, one should speak the truth and not get angry. Be it just a little, when asked for, one should give. By means of these three causes, one shall proceed into the presence of the Devas. Satchang bhane nakut jaya tadja appampi ajito ete hiti hitani kache devana santike. Tamapada, verse 224. Giving is a sort of wealth that cannot be taken away or destroyed by thieves, enemies, kings, and fires as the Aditya Sutta of the Sangyutta Nikaya lets us know. Merits in general, including forms generated by dana, have been compared to rel relatives excuse me, that receive one who is dear to them. They receive one in like manner when the donor of merits goes from this world to the next. See Dhammapada verse 220 for that. In the other world, after death, again, merits are further said to be the support Thitta for beings, as the Buddha taught in the Kaladana Sutta. Chaga again is said to lead to happiness in the afterlife. In fact, the Nittikanda Sutta maintains that merits give anything that one wishes for. Anything. It thus follows also quite naturally that the miser, through his stinginess, generates exactly the lack he fears so much and tries to actually avoid so fervently with his meanness. See Matcharya Sutta Sangyutta Nikaya, Matchari Sutta, excuse me, Sangyutta Nikaya. A constant stream of merit, growing daily, is produced by means of the donation of stationary items, such as forests, parks, ponds, bridges, and the like, some of which are also said to engender the attainment of absorption meditation, jhanam, and similar qualities. The Buddha explained in the Sangyutta Nikaya, Vanaropa Sutta, to quote, those who set up a park or a grove, the people who construct a bridge, a place to drink and a well, those who give a residence, for them merit always increases, both by day and by night. Those are the people going to heaven, established in Dhamma, endowed with virtue, end quote. When considering gifts of food, there are also a number of further distinct benefits that accrue to the giver. To the giver, excuse me. Giving life, beauty, happiness, strength and intelligence by means of food, one will gain exactly these karmic fruits oneself, either as a human or heavenly being. They will. A few specific results with their corresponding items have also been mentioned in the Kingdada Sutta, Sangyutta Nikaya. Food bestows strength, clothes beautify, transportation gives ease, lighting produces vision, a residence combines it all. Overall, some other noteworthy benefits of giving include being dear and appealing to people at large. One is admired by good people. They also search out one's company. One is possessed of a disposition that causes inspiration. 
experiencing personal self-confidence in assemblies. A good reputation about oneself spreads. One gains authority. Good human or heavenly rebirth. One fulfills one's duties as a householder in general and as a Buddhist lay devotee in relation to monastics, uh, as a father, husband, friend, and executive in particular. When dana is given, the generic results are said to be the acquisition of great wealth and possessions. But when given with faith or conviction, the results are also said to consist of being well-built, handsome, extremely inspiring, endowed with a lotus-like complexion. When given attentively, one's children, wives, workers, etc., are said to listen carefully, lend their ears and pay attention to what one tells them. A timely gift, on the other hand, is said to have the effect of acquiring possessions in season. We may be reminded of cases where potential heirs have not to wait long after the death of the heritor, or of cases where they get to enjoy the inheritance even during the lifetime of the heritor. When dana is bestowed with the mind that doesn't hold back, anukkahita chittu, and feels no regret after the offering has been made, one's mind inclines to the actual enjoyment of one's acquired wealth. Not as is the case with some celebrities who, despite their wealth, actually live as if broke. If we give without afflicting ourselves or others, we may expect that, that our possessions are safe from various dangers such as floods, fire, unloving hares, the government and thieves. Some of the 32 major and 18 minor physical characteristics of the Buddha, such as having clear, blue eyes, a smooth skin, regularly formed limbs, possessing calves like that of an antelope, a pleasant voice, neat, smooth fingernails, unblemished teeth, radiant complexion, and a great demeanor are, in part, the result of giving excellent treasures such as soft rugs, fine silk, gold and coral, as well as adornments of various kinds. The 18 minor characteristics are also said to bear a connection to the giving of supplementary items that are accompaniments of the main things to be given, sapariwaradana. Dana is also highly relevant to establish social harmony in society at large and the monastic community in particular, as can be gathered from passages that take up the theme of the four bases of maintaining good relationships, Sanghahawattu, of which Dana is part of, alongside kind speech, Peiyawajjang, helpful conduct or attitude, Attacharya, and equality in behavior, Samanatata. The Kula Sutta, a discourse preserved in the Sangyutta Nikaya, relates how a chieftain criticized the Buddha, accusing him of acting not out of kindness and sympathy for the people, not for their protection. He based this allegation on the fact that the Buddha would, together with a large retinue, walk for arms during a famine. The Buddha retorted that he does not know of any family during 91 years that he recollected that has been brought to ruin through giving alms. On the contrary, great wealth and riches accrue to them on account of such practices as giving, telling the truth and restraint. If we consider all the benefits that we have covered so far, this statement of the Blessed One holds all the more true. There is just no proper ground for critiquing righteous giving. Giving is also of such a nature, the Sumana Sutta of the Anguttara Nikaya reports, that it still produces distinction for uh, one who is generous over the one who is not in lifespan, beauty, happiness, fame, and authority. When people are otherwise equal in faith, virtuous behavior, and wisdom. Even when one is immoral, the Supreme Buddha taught us, but gives generously the resultant rebirth due to immorality, if not too severe, can be expected to be one among animals. But through the power of the result of dana, various benefits may procure to the animal thus reborn, such as obtaining rich food. 
In this connection, we may consider pet dogs being spoiled by their owners with choice food. All these details may perhaps be a bit daunting to comprehend and keep in mind all the time. We may also find the task of engaging in some of the higher forms outlined equally daunting. But there is no need to despair. In the Dhammapada, verse 122, the Buddha taught, Do not despise merit, thinking that it will not come back to me. Through falling water drops, the water pot fills up. The wise one is filled with merit, accumulating little by little. Mawa manye ta punya sa namantang aga misati, uda bindu nipate na uda kumbho pi purati, thiro purati punya sa tokang tokang pi ajinang. Bear also in mind that minor gifts can have tremendously beneficial outcomes, outweighing the efforts involved above and beyond. How is that? Consider the case of Venerable Taraniya, an Arahant, who, in a former rebirth, had built a bridge for the people to use. For 91 years, 91, he did not suffer in realms of subhuman misery, Dukkati, although even lesser gifts of leaves or flowers may have exactly the same effects, especially given to worthy recipients, such as Buddhas. It is remarkable that stinginess can even affect our meditation progress in attaining any distinction as noble disciples, Aryapukkala. Five types of stinginess in particular have been mentioned as qualities that make it impossible to attain the first four jhanas, as well as the path and fruitions of stream entry all the way up to Arahatya. The five types, according to a string of discourses contained in the Anguttara Nikaya, are stinginess regarding one's monastery, one's family of supporters, personal gains, one's status, and dhamma. Although this is set in the context of monasticism, we may be allowed to apply it for lay people as well. In general, if we are unable to share the pleasantness of our own dwelling places, or to see our co monastics family and friends on friendly terms with others, if we want to monopolize them, our mind will be constantly agitated, preventing it from entering a calm and collected state, or from producing wisdom. The same holds true if we always have to be the top dog, not being able to stand it if someone has equally good or better qualities. Lastly, if we cling to being the sole authority on the Dhamma, by extension any worldly knowledge that is useful, not willing to share the deeper passages of the Tipitaka and his commentaries, we are also incapable of true progress and peace. The pairing of giving in conjunction with patience, Kanti, accomplishes non-greed and non-hatred. If energy joins forces with giving, it helps consummate generosity and learning. Whereas when practiced alongside meditation, sensual desire and hatred are abandoned. The triad of giving, virtue and meditation, bhavana, perfects the three bases of meritorious action, punya kariyawa thuni. In the right frame of undertaking, dana may lead to the attainment of saintly disciples, Aryapukkala, the state of individual Buddhas, Pacheka Buddha, and perfectly self-enlightened Buddhas, Sammasambuddha. When dana is given with the intention that it may lead on to the realization of Nibbana, the final goal in supreme, everlasting bliss, it may function as a sufficing condition, a strong reason for its realization. Lastly, let us now consider how we could apply our own generosity that has, hopefully, somewhat grown in the strength by now. The Visuddhimagga, the classic handbook of the Theravada, will be the source of choice for the sake of convenience. For the recollection of generosity or giving up, chaganusati to succeed, we should, according to the Visuddhimagga, be devoted to the constant practice of giving up or generosity. If one is just the beginner on the path of giving, one should resolve that from now on, when there is a recipient, one won't eat before having offered some gift. On that same day, one should set out to practice dana according to one's own means, especially with those having distinguished qualities. Holding the action of giving then in mind, the mental representation, 
nimittang, one must retreat into solitude and recollect one's own generosity. One should also bear in mind some of the various benefits that have been discussed so far. If one does so, one's mind is, at that time, not obsessed by greed, aversion or delusion. One's mind has rectitude, being inspired by generosity. In this way, the mental hindrances niwarana, are curbed and the factors of absorption meditation arise, but only the excess type, upachara samadhi. When devoted to this recollection, one becomes ever more inclined to give. The preference is for non-greed and one acts in conformity with loving-kindness and gains fearlessness. One has, accordingly, abundant happiness and gladness. But if one penetrates to nothing higher, one is, in, in the least, heading toward a happy destination. To conclude, uh, let me briefly recap what has been covered up until now. This discord was intended to provide some depth to the concept of giving as it is understood in the party tradition as a whole, with the aim to serve as a practical foundation for what good is theoretical knowledge without application. As the German poet and scientist to apply German pronunciation, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe put it, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough. We must do. At this point, I would like to only provide a few concluding and summarizing remarks. I hope that the detailing of the characteristics, manifestations, functions and causes of giving and the listing of the factors that make up the various kinds of offerings, as well as the qualities of the actual donors and recipients, will help in that endeavor of practice. In the same way, I'm optimistic that the explanations of the benefits of dana will work an especially noticeable influence on our starting, establishing and gradually perfecting the practice of giving. From what can be gathered from our tradition, it is worth it to fully engage in it. Now I'd like to invite especially all of you who have contributed to the purchase of my device and the related software to bear this instance of generosity in mind so that it may lead you to happiness in the here and now and to the re realization of the paths and fruitions of our hardship in this very life. Therewith, having entered into seclusion for some time, you may even fully engage in the practice of meditation that can serve as the foundation for liberating wisdom to occur. This is the pattern of course everyone else can apply as well. To end with, let us recite together the determination that we honor the Buddha, his Dhamma and the Sangha with our practice of generosity and in general. Let us also share our merits and aspire that our generosity may lead us to the realization of Nibbana. Imaya Dhamma Nu Dhamma Patipatiya Buddhang Bhujemi Imaya Dhamma Nu Dhamma Patipatiya Dhammang Bhujemi Imaya Dhamma Nu Dhamma Patipattaya Sanghang Bhujemi Atta Imaya Patipadaya Jati Jarabhyati Maranamha Parimucca Sami Imina Punya Kammena Mami Bala Samagamo Satang samagamo ho tu yawa nipana patia Idang wo nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyata yo Idang wo nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyata yo Idang wo nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyata yo Idang me punyang asawakaya wahang ho tu Idang me punyang nipana sa pajayo hotu Mama punya bhagang sa pasata nang bhaji me te sa pe me sa mang punya bhagang labhantu Akasa taja bumata deva naga mahitika punyang tangan modita chirang rakhantu sa sa nang Akasatta cha bhumatta devanaga mahittika 
ุญญังทังอนุโมดิตาจิรังรักขันตุเดสนังอากาสัทธาจาบุมมัตตาเดวานากามหิติกาุญญังทังอนุโมดิตาจิรังรักขันตุมังปรังอดันดูอาร์เต้และเขาถามว่าอะไรคือวิธีการที่คนพูดคุยได้โดยไม่ต้องเป็นของประเภทหรือไอเทมฉันคิดว่าคำถามนี้ถูกตอบเมื่อพูดถึงสองประเภทที่เป็นของประเภทของการพูดคุยนั่นคือของประเภทของการพูดคุยของการเห็นความเป็นจริงและของประเภทของการสอนฉันคิดว่านี่ถูกตอบเมื่อพูดถึงสองประเภทที่เป็นของประเภทของการพูด So the second question is from Burke McLean. It runs as follows: Can you be too generous? Which is a good question, I think. Relevant, a good question. I would say it depends. I recall one passage where the Buddha advised that part of one's gains also should be taken by oneself in order to forestall bitterness or envy. When I remember correctly. In any case, the Buddha advised in the p a t a m a b u t t a k a Sutta, contained in the Sangyutta Nikaya, to quote, "As cool water in an uninhabited region evaporates when not drunk, so too, when a sinner acquires wealth, they neither use it themselves nor give it away, but when a wise and sensible person gets hold of wealth, they use it and do their duty." That head, having supported the family unit, blameless, goes to a heavenly place. End quote. We actually find the Buddha advising how to spend wealth, which includes making others happy, family, friends, renunciants, etc., as well as oneself. So, uh, the focus has to be also on oneself to some degree. If a family is declared by an official act of the sangha as in training, should any bhikkhu receive offerings from them at their home, he would commit a p a r t i d e s a n i a offense. The phrase "in training" is defined in terms of increasing faith but decreasing wealth. In order to protect the family from ruin, this training rule was laid down by the Buddha. Anatta Pindika is actually said to have become impoverished, in part through his generosity, but later regained wealth. In any case, his generosity led him to a glorious life in heaven. So we cannot say that even if one neglects oneself, that it doesn't have some or actually great karmic fruits for us to come. So I hope this answers the question from Bert McLean.